the community, which now numbers around 135,500 of Israel, Israel's population of more than 8 million and includes many born in Israel, has long complained of discrimination, racism, and poverty. More than half of the Ethiopians in Israel live in poverty, and only half graduate from high school. The Israeli government is also frequently accused of racism for deporting African migrants. In 2013, Israel also admitted to forcibly administering birth control injections to Ethiopian Jewish women without their consent or knowledge. And on April 26, 2015, Damas Fakadie, a 21-year-old soldier of Ethiopian descent, was heading home alone, in uniform, when he was beaten by two Israeli police officers in the Tel Aviv sub suburb of Holon where he lives. The unprovoked assault caught on video was broadcast on national television and went viral on social networks, motivating young generations of Ethiopian Israelis to take to the streets in recent days, demonstrating against police racism and brutality. In response to the protests, Israeli riot police have fired stun grenades and water cannon on thousands of ethnic Ethiopian Jewish citizens in an attempt to clear this protest in the heart of Tel Aviv. With us today on Middle East in Focus is David Sheen, an independent journalist and filmmaker originally from Toronto, Canada, who now lives in Demona, Israel. I just want to share with you a brief part of his written reflections in his article, Ethiopian Israelis Protest Bl Police Brutality, But Do Black Lives Matter If They're Not Jews? And this article was published in Alternet, and definitely check it out and we'll give you all the links and information for it. So here's just a brief reflection from that article by David Sheen. The April 30 protests picked up where a January march to Jerusalem left off. Last year, Israeli police bullied an Ethiopian Israeli family into burying one of their sons before being allowed to see his body. Though paralyzed by grief, they suspected foul play because officers had badly beaten the young man and dumped him in a police parking lot four months earlier. Though his death bred bitter resentment in the community, it would take four months for Ethiopian anger to reach a critical mass. The protests against racist police brutality in the United States that have exploded in recent times seem to have inspired Ethiopian Israelis to take to the streets as well. On April 30th, some Ethiopian protesters drew a direct connection between their own struggle and the ongoing anti-racist urban uprising in the U.S. with banners reading, Black Lives Matter and chants of, Baltimore is here. And meanwhile, polls show that an overwhelming majority of Jewish Israelis, including Ethiopian Israelis, approve of the plan of action that the government is carrying out, rounding 50,000 non-Jewish Africans out of Israeli cities into desert detention centers and from there back to Africa. In fact, just 48 hours after the Jerusalem protest, a few hundred Israelis gathered in central Tel Aviv to protest these deportations, arguing that the non-Jewish Africans, asylum seekers who fled slavery in Eritrea and ethnic cleansing in Sudan, should be granted refugee status. But with the exception of one or two radical outliers, the crowd was completely devoid of Ethiopian Israelis. In Israel, black Jews are just as likely to support the expulsion of the asylum seekers as white Jews, and perhaps even more so. David Sheen began blogging when he first moved to Israel in 1999 and later went on to work as a reporter and editor at the daily Israeli newspaper Haaretz. For over a decade, Sheen has been producing written and video content on critical topics that the mainstream media ignores, publishing these reports on open platforms to make them available for free to as many people as possible. His work for Plus 972, Mondo Weiss, Al Jazeera, Alternet, Electronic Intifada, and other online news sites can be read at his website, davidsheen.com. David's currently working on a book about African immigrants to Israel and the struggles they face. Welcome to Middle East in Focus, David Sheen. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. Great to be here. So uh, perhaps we should start off by learning from you what inspired a nice Jewish independent journalist and filmmaker from Canada to move to Israel in 1999, and what inspires you to stay there? Yeah, the, I guess th those are two different questions, certainly. Um, well, when I first moved to Israel, as you said, in 1999, I was 25 years old, but it wasn't my first time there. I'd, I'd been maybe 10 times previous, and that's because my father was born there and his parents were born there. So I spent a lot of summers in Israel just visiting. That's where most of my family was, and, you know, cousins and grandparents and such. So um, 
you know, I'd already had Israeli citizenship from birth, and it was the place we went to. And and frankly, when you grow up in eastern Canada, it's damn cold, and, and the summers are lovely, but they're so, so, so short, and the winters are so long. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least admit that that was some of it, just uh, wanting to live in a hotter country. And, uh, yeah, there were, there were some ideological factors, too. You know, I did grow up in a really... Uh, Zionist home and environment and school and youth group and synagogue, et cetera, et cetera. That was, you know, basically my entire life as a, as a minor growing up in my parents' home. It wasn't really until uh, university that I started, you know, breaking out of that bubble and meeting people from different cultural backgrounds. And I was, I guess, what you'd call a PEP, uh, progressive except for Palestine, you know, anti-racist, anti-sexist, you know, all this stuff. But but on Israel, you know, I, I grew up staunchly Zionist, and that was how I saw the world. And it, it was... Um, I guess that that was that was you know me the way I saw you know me wanting to be a a good good boy and a not just a good Jewish boy but a good person uh, that was the collective that I was taught that I belonged to and and furthermore if I wanted to contribute to something greater than myself that is where my uh, efforts should and, and sure you know I contributed to you know on homeless issues in Toronto and, and and other such issues but that was kind of how I saw my collective experience and so I moved to Israel and. For both for my own personal reasons and and also for you know these political reasons, but uh, with a couple months, just a couple months into the experience of living there and actually you know not being part of any organized group, but just living my life, having to make a living, find a place to live, and just having interactions with people and seeing society for what it was, I very very rapidly my political views changed just in a couple months because it, I saw it was very very different from what I'd been taught. And D David, actually, if I could just ask you really quick, you know, before you move on, because you brought up a really interesting point about your own history, which is that you were anti-racist, but yet Zionist. Back then, how did you reconcile that seemingly, that, that, that contradiction? <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's going back a whole bunch of years now, you know, about 15 years or so. So I'm trying to think of, well, um, I guess, I I was on a campus that didn't really um, it wasn't like today you have campuses that are really hot spots and where people are really like like today I find it's extremely difficult to be a liberal Zionist today because Israel's outward face is so from my perspective so brutal and so over the top racist and and ultra nationalist and and frightening that uh, it, it it leaves very very room wiggle room for a person to claim to be a, a liberal and to embrace Zionism. But at the time, it wasn't necessarily the case. Not because Israel was so different. I mean, it was. We we have gotten a lot worse in recent years. But also, th the internet was in its infancy. Like I got an email address in 1990. Three, I think, if I remember correctly, and, and I was one of the first people in my university who did. It wasn't that uh, there was uh, the web and, and there were people were surfing and you could see videos of what was happening in downtown Hebron or something like that. We didn't have access to all this information, so we didn't know about how bad it was, you know. And and since I grew up on these other stories, uh, that's what I believed. And what um, were the so things? Oh, sorry, David. I was going to oh, go ask, what, what were the things that you saw? You know, you said within months of arriving there in 99, you started to say thing, see things that made you question your, you know, beliefs and what you had been taught. What were the kind of kinds of things that you saw? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what, what really uh, hit it for me was, I guess, that I had always been taught uh, that the reason for the occupation of the West Bank was for security reasons. And that was the reason that uh, people's non-Jewish people, specifically Palestinian people's freedoms, were limited. I didn't realize to what extent, but in the theoretical, the reason for it, the justification for it, was a security reason. That's how I understood it. And of course, I, everyone can relate to uh, being conscious of their own personal security. Everyone wants to live. Everyone wants to the, you know, the right to life and, and health. So, so I identified that with that. And then when I got there, and then just casually I, I happened to meet Palestinian people. Um, it was actually um, brothers from Nablus. They, I was living in Tel Aviv at the time. They were coming from Nablus every day to do construction work in the building that I was living in, coincidentally. And that's how I happened to meet them, coming in and out. Hey, how's it going? What's up? Have a cigarette, have a coffee. And just chit-chatting with them and talking and becoming friends with them, I realized that they had to leave their house at like 
I don't know, 3.30 or 4 in the morning every single day uh, just to get to the job site on time. And and then I, I, I it, it kind of, everything started to unravel from there because I realized that we had a captive uh, workforce, essentially, people who could be perennially exploited for decades on end to always be an underclass. And so it, it was like... It wasn't that I was the first human being to ever notice this was happening. Like, everyone knew it was going on. Just, <laughs> it, I guess it had become the norm. And, and I, I could not accept that that could be the norm. Because um, that, that ran into conflict with my socialist values, my belief that people are equal and should be equal and should have equal opportunities. So once I realized that there was no security reason for keeping these people um, uh, statusless and, and, uh, and rightsless, so that's when things started to switch. I mean, it still took a couple more years for everything to fall into place, but but that's really what triggered it. Mm-hmm. And so take us through your journey in terms of your acti- <laughs> activism from there. Sure, sure. Well, um, as, as uh, I think you know, we were kind of writing to each other. I, I my my journey actually went into ecological issues after that, uh, because we're also talking about 1999, the Battle of Seattle, and. You know, people are coming into consciousness about corporate globalization and the destruction of the environment, and et cetera, et cetera. And so, for me, that was an issue that I took on and became really involved in. And I ended up, you know, learning uh, ecological architecture and making a documentary film about that. I traveled all over the world, including to southern and northern California and all up and down the left coast. And and uh, that was, you know, an amazing, amazing experience to to go to Ghana and to go to Ethiopia and to go to Yemen and, and, and to UK too and, and, and to and the American Southwest and see these beautiful, incredible ecological homes that are built in a way that respects the earth and gives back to the earth and, and, and makes sure that the people living in it are continuing to be healthy and not, you know, suck in chemicals for the rest of their lives and not be in debt to the bank for the next several decades and have to work in a crap job they hate just to pay for it. So all around, it was this uh, ecological, you know, but also holistic thing that um, that I, I really got wrapped up in, and I loved making this documentary movie, and it was translated into over a dozen languages. So that was an amazing, amazing experience. I really uh, highly advocate people who haven't really even thought of that. Well, we know what healthy food is. You know, we want it to be organic and not genetically modified. But people don't really unpack that piece about shelter. And if you think about it, it's something like 50% of the, uh, or maybe 40%, I don't remember, but, you know, a huge percentage of the energy we use as a society goes into physical structures, and a huge part of the pollution we create as a society also from uh, the building of and use of physical structures. So we really, as a society, need to rethink this eco piece. And, and it just seemed to me that no one was really, in the mainstream at least, talking about uh, ecological shelters. So that's what I ended up delving into for several years and, and was going to continue to do so. But when I, uh, after kind of this tour around the world with this ecological architecture movie, and I came back to Israel in 2010, and that's when things just started to pop off at an insane rate in terms of the racism just jacked up several notches to the point where it was just unrecognizable. I, I, I could not... Like, these were things I'd read about in history books, that things could be this bad, but I didn't imagine that I would ever see them in my lifetime, where you have just, you know, like, masses, throngs of people marching through African areas of town, screaming, get out of the country, you know, you're rapists, you're murderers, you're thieves, get out, all of you get out, you're all of you are... I, I, I just, you know... I, this was something that I only had read about. I'd never experienced this in my life. Definitely not growing up in Toronto or any other place in the world that I'd visited. And when I, you know, came back to Israel and started, again, working as a journalist, like you mentioned earlier, at Haaretz, and I'm out in the streets in downtown Tel Aviv seeing this stuff, just turning on my camera, pressing record, and I knew that no one else was, you know, really documenting this, and, and, and no one really cared to. And sadly, and and I felt like this obligation. Well, you know, this is this is off the charts racism. People need to know about it, and that's why I kind of dropped the whole ecological piece or left it where it was. In a, you know, that movie is now online. Anyone can in the world can go see it. But I said, okay, this is the next thing I got to devote um, my time and energy to is kind of exposing this, you know, crazy levels of racism that uh, is is hasn't stopped really since then. 
And I'm talking about so from 2010 till today. David, can you discuss the differences, um, if any, in how Jewish and non-Jewish Africans are treated in Israeli society, including work opportunities, uh, access to housing and educational opportunities? Sure, 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 of course. Okay, so just to run you through, I mean, there's, uh, there's a few different groups of uh, uh, sub-Saharan African people, we'll call them, uh, or black people living in Israel. First of all, there's African Palestinians. Uh, you know, part of the population, part of the Palestinian population, uh, are, their origins are in Africa, and there's no, there's no surprise. Israel is in Africa. Israel is in Northeast Africa. So there's no shocker that people who've been living here for hundreds of years or thousands of years are also black. And, but in addition to, I'm put them aside for a minute. Um, in the Jewish, okay, so there's, uh, different waves of black immigrants over the course of Israel's history. The first one came in the 70s and the 80s, and these are African-Americans who kind of embraced an Afrocentric version of Judaism, and, and they moved to Israel in the 70s and 80s. They're called the African Hebrew Israelites, and they live actually in the town that I live in, in Dimona, most of them for the most part, several thousand, about 10% of the town here. And when they first arrived, same thing. The government did everything it could to deport them. It saw them as not Jews, not the right kind of Jew, or not Jewish enough, or not racially Jewish, or, you know, not, not, not practicing the, the Euro- European version of Judaism, the Ashkenazi version of Judaism, or, you know. So, so there were efforts for decades to deport these people. Eventually, um, the government realized that uh, it could cut a deal with them because, you know, th- these people, they have, they're American citizens. They have Western privilege. They can call up uh, their friends back in Chicago who can lobby their local, um, b- the Black Congressional Caucus. And so to kind of put the, put the story down, they, they reach some compromise solution with them. They don't have full status in Israel, but they're also not being summarily drummed out of the country. That's the African Hebrews. Then we're talking about the black Jews, the Ethiopians, um, who immigrated to Israel in the 80s and early 90s, and, and a few coming now. Um, so this group also, I, I, was, I was actually just interviewing over the last couple of days uh, a brother who's um, an archaeologist, anthropologist, and you know, he kind of has been studying the history, a lot of the un, uh, unreported history of this community and their immigration to Israel. And some of the things I learned from him were just scandalous. I mean, even, even the, the known history is scandalous, but some of this stuff, like, okay, uh, yes, why was... Why were the black Jews brought to Israel only in the 80s? I mean, the other Jewish groups uh, were, like the other uh, Jewish communities of different countries around the world, most of them were brought to Israel or immigrated to Israel very soon after the state was established, an exception made for the Soviet Jews because the Soviet regime uh, did did not allow them to leave the country. But in all the other cases, in uh, you know, we're talking about the Iraqi community, the Egyptian community, we're talking about the Yemeni community, like most of the Jewish communities outside of Israel that decided to move to Israel did so soon after the state. Why did this, you know, and the reason why they weren't brought to Israel is because they're, because they're black. I mean, straight up, people, many people here said, oh, we don't, we don't know if they're really Jews or not. Are they really Jews, or are they practicing the right kind of Judaism, or are they really racially Jews, or could they perhaps be Africans who uh, re- retroactively created a redactive version of Judaism based on Ethiopian Christianity? I mean, they had all these theories, like, and what does it matter, you know, like, when it comes down to it, you know? These were all uh, questions that were never raised for any other community of Jews anywhere else in the world. It, it was only because they're black. I should, um, anyways, I'm not going to go into too much detail now, but... Uh, because you want me to compare and contrast. The, the, the bottom line is that they have every right in the country on paper, meaning they, they are full Israeli citizens, and as such, you know, the, on paper they have all the rights and obligations. They, they have Jewish privilege. So, unfortunately, they um, are the, the kind of the lowest-ranking socioeconomic class in Jewish Israeli society. They have the lowest. Uh, numbers of uh, average family income, the lowest numbers of high school graduation and university acceptance and, you know, working in professions, et cetera, et cetera. And that's to do no small amount with the way that the state uh, treated them when they first immigrated, kind of separating them and segregating them, and also because of, you know, inherent racism amongst people, white supremacy here that never was stamped out. And, and so you have 
whole neighborhoods of people signing secret pacts with one another to not rent apartments to black Jews, to Ethiopian Jews, or, or schools that are even state-sponsored schools that, are, that receive you know, budgets from the government, from my tax money, and they refuse to allow any Ethiopian students in. And it's like every single year, every September, there's protests outside of schools across the country by Ethiopian communities demanding, when are you going to let us enter these schools? So, yes, uh, on paper they have the same rights, but often they are discriminated against, and, and, and consequently, you know, they're, they're disproportionately in, in the lower rungs of, of, of the society, of Jewish society. Now, the last group... Uh, of African immigrants to Israel has come really in the last decade, between 2006 and 2012. And there we're talking about uh, about 65,000 Africans who are not Jewish, don't have a connection to Judaism, or don't claim one. And they are, in the main, about 90% of them are from the East African countries of Eritrea and Sudan, which both border Ethiopia, incidentally. Um, so this group of 65,000 people they came fleeing slavery in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, rather, in, in that country. For people who don't know, it's, it's like you're, it's a universal, uh, uh, how should I say this? Everyone is inducted into the military upon graduating from high school, and that can last for decades. It can last your entire life. It's essentially, you know, formal slavery. Uh, for life, for the entire population. So you have thousands of people fleeing every month all over the world. That's Eritrea. Sudan, I probably don't have to tell people. They've heard of the civil wars and the ethnic cleansing and the genocide in Darfur, etc. So, of course, people are fleeing all over the world. This is what refugees do, you know, trying to save their own skin. And you have, um, you know, at this point, United Nations says we have more refugees in the world than at any point since World War II. We have 50 million plus refugees. Um, and, 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 and so this is the, this, these are the people we're talking about. And it's almost always, it's in 80% of the cases, it's actually developing nations who bear the brunt, who, who uh, carry the burden of, deal, of, of taking in refugee populations. Actually, David, so, we just did really quick, we just did a show about that. But let me just make sure our listeners oh, wow. know who is talking. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So sure. I just want to remind our listeners that you are <laughs> listening to KPF. Yeah, take a breath. Take a moment. You are listening to KPFK's Middle East in Focus. We have an amazing guest with us today that is an incredible resource of information, David Sheen. He's an independent journalist and filmmaker originally from Toronto, Canada. He's now living in Demona, Israel. And he began blogging when he first moved to Israel in 1999. And he later went to work on it um, as a reporter and editor at the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz. So, David, just quickly, do, do the Ethiopian Jews rally around and support the non-Jewish African migrant workers and asylum seekers? No, it's it's so, so sad. I mean, for people who are accustomed to intersectionality and to joint solidarity struggle, uh, you, you unfortunately will be gravely disappointed to see what goes on here. Just the opposite. Um, and, and there's a few reasons for that, you know. Um, but, but essentially, as I pointed out in that article, really there's, you know, maybe one or two people of the few. First of all, okay, let's start with this. Very, very, very few people, period, come out in solidarity of the African refugee population here. There's almost, univer sadly, sadly, we're talking about 80% of the Jewish Israeli population, according to polls, who support ethnically cleansing the country of this population, meaning they support rounding these people out of Israeli cities into detention centers, and then from there out of the country to decant them back into Africa. So that's, that's to begin with. And, and yes, among this population, uh, you would think that at least there would be some Ethiopians. You would hope that there would be many people feeling that you know, their struggle is common because they're both suffering from state racism. But... Um, and this is where the, the, the big but, because we're dealing with overlapping systems of oppression and both white supremacy and Jewish supremacy. Um, so in, in the Jew, as I said, in the Jewish Israeli society, Ethiopians are the most discriminated against. And so the only things that gives them any privilege whatsoever is their status as Jews. And so that's something that they must cling to. That's something that they must harp on. That's something that they must emphasize, especially if they want the Israeli, the rest of Jewish Israeli society to empathize with them, right? They need to empathize that they're part of the Jewish collective because that's th their ticket into society, into privilege. And so what, you know, th this, this community of African refugees, it, it, yes, many, 
many of them are despised because they're black, and yes, because they're poor, and yes, because they're the most recent immigrants, but also because they're not Jews. You know, part of the same reason that people despise, or that sadly many people despise Palestinians for. Um, and, and so because of that, um, and, and it should also be said that, you know, yes, Zionism kind of preserved r- the racist uh, streams within Judaism and emphasized them. But, I mean, these r- racism is part of religion. And it's part of all nationalisms, and it's part of all groups that define an in and an out, and sometimes there's more and sometimes there's less. But, yeah, the, you know, the, the Ethiopian Jewish community, just like Ethiopia in general, is not without racism to begin with. So there already is, to begin with, some uh, sense of we're better because we're Jews. But Zionism amplifies it by doling out rights on the basis of membership in that group. And so, sadly, yeah, I, I interviewed like the one Jewish Ethiopian person who I've seen at these rallies consistently. You know, I interviewed her the other day, and and she told me that she actually saw a couple others, and they approached her and they said, "Wow, you support the Africans? Oh, you know, we married African husbands, and but we don't want to talk about it. We're in the closet about it because the rest of the community is so dead set against it." So, I mean, this kind of reflects on what's going on in Israel in general right now. The, the, the left or the anti-racist movement is so uh, against the ropes because the mood of ultranationalism is so ramped up to such, you know, frightening levels that even people who feel otherwise are afraid to publicly admit it because they don't want to lose their friends or their family or their job or, or, or worse. And David, what about Palestinians living in Israel and their relationship to this issue and their organizing work with respect to African migrants? Mm-hmm. And, and that's another, you know, kind of disappointing thing. Um, again, it can be understood in the context of the whole, like, divide and conquer and the different, how different groups are played off of each other. Uh, so typical to a colonial situation. But, but what you have here is um, the, the interests of these groups, you know, sure, they're both discriminated against because they're not Jewish. Of course, Palestinians are we're indigenous to here, and these people are the most recent immigrants, so they, their experiences are vastly different. Um, and, and also Palestinians, they, they have like large family networks, thankfully, which are, you know, and root them to the land. But the, when these group of Africans came, you have to remember that in Israeli society, um, Palestinian people, of course, they, they, you can be found in every facet of life, but overwhelmingly, they often do uh, blue collar jobs in Israeli society. Or should I say that, not that most Palestinians do blue collar jobs, but most blue collar jobs often are held by Palestinian citizens of Israel. In any case, once this group of African refugees came, they weren't allowed to work, but they had to survive. They had to make a living somehow, so they're often employed under the table and exploited, of course, in that situation. But the point is it drove many young Palestinian men out of the job market. Right. You know, because now there's a new group of people who are willing to work for even less, for mm-hmm. even under more exploitative conditions. And so this has bred some resentment among young, especially young male Palestinians who see this group as competing with them for scarce resources, in this case, jobs. Um, so that's one reason that you don't, and, and from the African side, one reason that you don't see more solidarity or more efforts to reach out is, I mean, don't forget in Sudan, for many of the people who escaped ethnic cleansing, it, w- it was, um, you know, Arab militias, specifically of Arab people attacking their villages, burning their villages to the ground because they were black and because they were not Arab. So there's still, you know, some resentment or some sus- many suspicion amongst Sudanese, even though Sudanese uh, often write and read and speak Arabic, um, but there's some suspicion and towards the you know Arab-speaking population here. And in some cases, the reason they came to Israel was because they knew that Israel was not Arab. It was one of the only countries in the region that was not Arab, or at least not primarily Arab. Or in any case, um, that's part of the reason for it. And, and also uh, for the same reason I mentioned earlier, the way that this community hopes to survive is by appealing to the Jewish Israeli population, which is the dominant, you know, powerful population here, and say, listen, we're not a threat, because this is the way that the government and right-wing groups have portrayed them. You know, we're, they're rapists and they're potential terrorists, and next thing you know, they're going to drive the Jews out of the country. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's like, it's crazy, but this is what people think. And so their effort to ingratiate themselves is to, you know, say, no, we are not that. We are uh, a 
you know, we're a population that is neutral. We can be, we can contribute to the country. Don't see us as, um, as, as potential enemies. And for them to ally themselves with Palestinians would give the exact opposite message because sadly for so many Israelis, that's how they see Arabic-speaking people, right. Palestinian people. They see them as the enemy. So any alliance with them would just sadly erase what little um, you know, sympathy that they have in the Israeli population, which is very, very, very marginal to begin with. Right. So would those are some of the factors that work against those alliances with the, Jewish, uh, with the Ethiopian Jews and with the Palestinian citizens of Israel. With time running short, um, I mm-hmm. wanted to ask you, the editor of Haaretz, Chami Shalev, tweeted about the recent African-Israeli protest in Tel Aviv. He tweeted, Israeli police have rarely used such force against Tel Aviv demonstrators. Now for the debate on whether this has anything to do with their color, unquote. Mm-hmm. Has that debate manifested? And if so, how, how has it played out in Israeli society? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, Hemi is Hemi is one of these like people who is trying just like Haaretz you know it's trying to walk a thin line uh, it's trying you know it, it doesn't want to come out and say sometimes it does you know it has writers who do but sometimes they're just you know trying to walk on the line of uh, we, we don't want to sound too leftist because we ourselves could be the next target of a crazed right wing attacker which did happen when I worked there so you know they're kind of walking this line Yes, of course, <laughs> it's racist. Now, the question is, will Israelis admit to it is another thing altogether. We, we find this phenomenon um, when Israelis are, you know, are kind of called out on the racism. They can say the most racist things. You can, I'm talking about not everyone, but people who are racist. When you call them out on their racist comments, the funniest thing, you know, people are, sometimes they'll admit to it, but often they're in utter denial. They just believe that Jewish people cannot be racist no matter what they're saying or thinking or feeling or doing. It's crazy, but, you know, it's kind of, we, we can talk about historical reasons for it. Anyways, why am I telling you this? People are in denial about it. Some people were like, yeah, I, I talked to some Ethiopian guy. He explained it to me. I get it. But I think for most people, they don't get it. I mean, it's hard for me to say. On one hand, there is widespread sympathy for the Ethiopian community because they're Jews. So people want that. No one's calling for them to be gone. But at the same time, you know, uh, just today I was on the bus when the radio came on and, and they were playing, uh, you know, they reported live from the Ethiopian, um, the, news, the news conference that they were holding in Tel Aviv saying, if we don't get what we demand for, these are the protest organizers, then we're going to go back into the streets and we're going to protest until we get our rights and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, all the people in the front row of the bus, including the bus, are like, oh, oh, yeah, uh-huh. They were making all these sarcastic comments, you know, publicly. And, and I, I, you know, it kind of gave me like a, a slice of, I mean, of course, it's not everyone in society, but it just kind of made me feel like for many people, they just don't get it. Like, it doesn't matter how many people have to, you know, scream in the streets. It, it, it isn't happening. That It isn't filtering through to people. They don't understand. Well, it's hard for anyone who's not black to understand what white supremacy and white privilege is, you know. If you don't experience it on your body, it's difficult to understand it. But no, in answer to your original question, I don't think that's happened yet. Clearly, the Israeli people have not fully internalized how angry and upset Jewish Africans are and how uh, each person feels a personal connection to this protest because they themselves have experienced police brutality or it's not them, it's their brother or their uncle or, you know, their best friends. And so we're not going to see an end to these protests anytime soon. Will the Israeli people come to terms with it and realize this is a problem and actually start dealing with it? And will they start dealing with some of the other kinds of racism in the country that are rampant? Uh, it's hard to say. Stay tuned. David, last question, because we we have to move into the fun drive portion of our program, but we want to bring it back to the United States, and you did a great article kind of trying to connect the issues of race and racism between Israel and the United States and what we see happening in the streets now with respect to the protests against police brutality. Can you do? Can you talk about um, the comparison contrast between race and racism there in Israel, here in the U.S. and you're from Canada, but I guess sort of North America, and then this whole issue of sister cities and how that relates to this broader issue, and then what we can do here in the U.S. to really promote the anti-racist efforts happening over there in terms of the work you're doing and others. Mm, thanks. Okay. Well. Oh, it's a, it's a mouthful, but I'll try to get to all of it. Um, 
Yeah. So first of all, there is this phenomenon of twin towns and sister cities, and um, many people have heard of it. But essentially, you know, different cities around the world have relationships with other cities in different countries. One city could have, you know, several different cities that it claims sisterhood with, and. It's something that came up for me when these uh, when this uprising began in Baltimore, as I started thinking about Baltimore's Israeli sister city, which is the city of Ashkelon. Now, um, there's a lot of racism in Israel in general, and there's a lot of cities that compete for the most racist city, but, but Ashkelon is seriously one of the top contenders um, and uh, towards Palestinians, towards African refugees, towards Ethiopians. Just a few years, uh, a couple of years ago, we had like uh, the siren went off because Ashkelon is close to Gaza, and rockets were raining down. And as people were running into their bomb shelters, you know, Ethi- an Ethiopian woman was kicked out of a bomb shelter. They wouldn't allow her into the bomb shelter because she's black, you know. And and, uh, and and the city councilor agreed with it. He's like, I I told them not to put Russians and Ethiopians in the same building. I knew this would happen. Like, it's ridiculous, you know, in this day and age, bombs falling and you won't let the woman in your bomb shelter, that's crazy racism, you know? And, and, and to get support from, from city council on that. So, and I can go on and on and on. The point is that um, would people in the United States stand for this level of racism? Well, clearly there is major, major, major problems with race in the United States. I don't mean to minimize them for a moment. But what I would say in general, at least from my experience, my impression is that Racism towards the African Jews in Israel, the Ethiopian Israelis, is somewhat similar to the racism towards African Americans. It's a broad generalization, but I mean by that is that, yes, there is still a huge, huge racial problem. That's why people are protesting in the U.S., and that's why they're protesting here. But at least most people are embarrassed about it. Most people aren't proud of it. You know, um, and even here, as people collude to keep apartments away from Ethio- out of you know Ethiopians out of your neighborhoods, you do it secretly. You're embarrassed about it. Whereas the racism towards the other groups, the non-Jewish groups, is people are proud of it. Many people are proud of it. They're not embarrassed. They'll say it. You know, and, and we have people proudly proclaiming that they are boycotting these groups. So, what I mean by this is that the racism in this country is off the charts. It's like living in the United States in the, you know, the 40s or the 50s in the, in the Deep South. So the question is, if you're going to have a sister city, uh, whatever that means, you know, do you want to have that kind of relationship in a, with a community that is so over-the-top racist? Is that someone who you want to be associated with? I would, you know, if I was a Baltimorean, I would be embarrassed about this relationship with Ashkelon. And I would want answers. You know, as, as the mayor of Baltimore, I would say, wow, all these things are happening in Baltimore. I want some assurances that, ba- that Ashkelon is going to change its practices, or else I don't want a relationship with them because you're an embarrassment to me. As bad as things are in Baltimore, they're, you know, much, much worse. In here. And, of course, I, I don't want to compare one to one. Everyone's suffering. It's not an Olympics of who's suffering worse. But, yeah, we're talking about off-the-charts racism here. And I do call on people to look it up online, Find out who your twin, you know, your, the city wherever you're living, if it's in California or another part of the states, who your twin city is. Actually, in California, it's Sacramento, California, that is also paired with Ashkelon. There's three American cities that uh, have this sister city status with Ashkelon. And one of them, beyond being Baltimore, is uh, Sacramento, California. So find out. <laughs> and, and maybe that's a way, that's a leverage point. I mean, you know, if it's a nonviolent tactic, I'm going to be the last person to tell you to stop doing it. We need everything because there aren't enough people here to stop this wave of racism. It's getting worse, and it's getting worse quicker and quicker. And so if, if what you can do wherever you are, use the skill set you have and use whatever leverage you have in your community, uh, people like myself who want to see everyone on the land living in equality – in justice and in peace, yes, we would greatly appreciate, I can speak for myself, I would greatly appreciate if you would do your part to demand that that be the case and withhold your friendship or your sister, your sisterhood, so to speak, uh, until that happens. And I can offer that Los Angeles is uh, sister cities with the Israeli uh, city of Eilat, and perhaps people can right. look up and see what some of the policies of that city are is and write to our fine mayor, Eric Garcetti, uh, if you disagree with their policies and don't think that 
we should have a relationship like that. Well, as David said, this uh, the demonstrations in Israel are not likely to end soon, so we hope to have you back um, to discuss it further. Keep up the great work, because as you say, there's nobody else covering this topic um, other than you. So we want to thank our guest, David Sheen, independent journalist and filmmaker. His work for Plus 972, Mondo Weiss, Al Jazeera, Alternate, Electronic Intifada, and other online news sites can be read at his website, which has tons of valuable information. That's davidsheen, S-H-E-E-N, dot com. Thank you, David, and we hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so, so much. Have a great, great day. Take care. Peace. Thank you.